It is often the case that the smallest and most unassuming creatures may hide the strangest of secrets. One could scarcely envision a more unassuming creature than a typical salamander. Nevertheless, there are a number of unusual surprises lurking among this group of oft-overlooked amphibians. Before looking at the salamanders themselves, I would like to take a moment to consider their somewhat unusual mythology. In a number of traditions, salamanders have an association with fire in some form or another. Whether they are depicted as elemental spirits of fire or as curious creatures able to extinguish flames, this association is quite perplexing considering the distinctly non-fiery nature of the actual salamander. One theory as to the cause of this unusual reputation is based upon the hibernating habits of certain salamander species. It is easy enough to envision a pile of firewood beside a cottage at the forest's edge, half covered in the snows of a cold winter's evening. A few logs are retrieved, with their bearer unaware of the diminutive little amphibians hibernating in various hollows and crevices, perhaps wedged between the bark and the underlying wood. The logs are set in the hearth where a fire is lit. Soon enough, the wood is set ablaze, and the sleeping salamanders are rather rudely and abruptly awakened. Fortunately enough, the residual chill in their flesh and the moisture on their skin affords some degree of protection from the encroaching flames. They have time enough to escape the ensuing inferno, and escape they do, scampering out quite precipitously across the cottage floor. The human residents are perhaps almost as surprised as the salamanders in this little incident. Seeing strange little creatures seemingly born from the fire itself might readily lead to a burning mythos taking shape. There is another possibility, though. A great many salamander species have bright colors which include various hues of red, orange, and yellow. Such markings are typically warnings of toxicity rather than indications of a fiery disposition. Still, this could certainly add to the apparent associations. Speaking of toxicity, many salamander species can be surprisingly poisonous. Such toxins make a certain degree of sense when the creature is small and generally lacking in natural armor or weaponry. Well, at least in some cases. Whether sensible or not, such poisons have led to a number of rather exaggerated tales of salamanders poisoning wells or corrupting fruit trees. The associations between newts and witches should be familiar enough to anybody who has a passing acquaintance with Macbeth, though the Eye of Newt in the rather infamous recipe might hopefully refer to a somewhat coded name for a more botanical ingredient. In any case, the salamander has gained a surprisingly vibrant mythology in a number of traditions. This is almost a pity, as the truth behind these little creatures is at least as unusual and remarkable. So let us set aside the fantastical beasts and the machinations of witchcraft, at least for the moment, and consider the creatures themselves. I recall hearing a rather simple explanation of a salamander in answer to a child's inquiry. I believe the substance of this description was something akin to, like a lizard, but slimy and without scales. While this does have a degree of accuracy, it doesn't quite do justice to these little creatures. Not only do they lack the scales of lizards, but they also lack their claws. Some groups lack lungs as well, for that matter. One would scarcely expect such creatures to be dangerous, yet a number of species can be quite lethal under the right circumstances. Like the frogs and toads, they are amphibian tetrapods, and the default life cycle is an aquatic larval form with gills, and a more or less terrestrial adult. This is similar to the typical tadpole one finds in frogs, however there are quite a few exceptions to this basic developmental path. The adult salamander body is typically slender, with a prominent tail and four limbs, more or less sprawling out to the creature's sides. Most often, the front pair of limbs have four clawless fingers each, while the back pair carry five. Such digits may or may not be webbed, depending upon the species and circumstance. A salamander's head is usually dominated by a set of rounded jaws and a pair of bulbous eyes. In some species, a pair of paratoid poison glands can be seen as faint swellings behind the eyes. There are no external ears, 
and most other facial features are subtle at best. This gives the creature a somewhat simple appearance, reminiscent of a cartoon, and the large eyes lend it an air of cuteness by some estimations. Still, the eyes are more than mere ornamentation, of course. And not surprisingly, they give a typical salamander a reasonably serviceable sense of vision. Perhaps surprisingly, they also often aid the creature in swallowing food. As with frogs and toads, when the eyes are closed, the eyeballs push down into the roof of the mouth, helping to close the throat and push food deeper into the gullet. The mouth of a typical salamander has a few other surprises as well. There are usually a series of tiny, conical teeth in the upper and lower jaw, much as might be expected. However, there are also premaxillary teeth in front of the row of upper jaw teeth, and vomerine and palatial teeth behind these teeth, protruding from the roof of the mouth. This array of pointy dentition isn't much good for chewing, but it is generally more than adequate for holding prey as the salamander dines. Though their fare tends to consist of small invertebrates, these creatures are quite happily carnivorous. Much like the adults, the larval forms of salamanders are similarly fond of animal prey. Granted, this prey is often quite small, but it is still the sort of food that tends to try and swim away. In contrast to the tadpoles seen in frogs and toads, the tadpoles of salamanders have prominent external gills. These gills are visible as feathery projections just behind the head on either side. They are often red in hue, due to their respiratory function. After all, a rich blood supply is to be expected in respiratory tissues, and the skin must be thin enough for relatively rapid gas exchange. Thus, it can be quite hard to miss the myriad capillaries weaving their way through these gill structures. One might think that having such delicate tissues exposed to the open water is a bit hazardous, or at least ill-advised. While this may be true, the salamanders possess two traits that greatly help with this issue. One is a tendency towards toxicity. A great many salamanders produce remarkably poisonous skin secretions, which are sufficient to keep would-be parasites from nibbling on their gills too badly. The other trait is an often remarkable capacity for regeneration. It is not uncommon for a salamander to be able to regrow its tail after severing it in a somewhat desperate gamble to distract a predator. There are many salamander species that can go so far as to regrow lost limbs as well. Compared to this, replacing a few bits of misplaced gill tissue would be a minor inconvenience at most. These external gills work well enough for some salamander species to retain them into adulthood. There are a couple of variations in this odd little adaptation. To properly understand them, one must have at least a passing understanding of amphibian metamorphosis. All vertebrates share a number of features beyond the obvious vertebrae, and one of these features is the thyroid gland. This gland produces a hormone that is important in regulating metabolic rates and certain aspects of development. In amphibians, this thyroid hormone is also a vital component of the metamorphic process. It would appear that many of the alterations in amphibian body structure are initiated by exposure to this hormone. In salamanders, this includes the breakdown and absorption of the larval gills. One vital component of thyroid hormone is iodine. As iodine is essentially a mineral, it cannot be replicated by organic processes. If there is not enough iodine in an environment, thyroid hormone cannot be properly produced. In humans, this results in the rather unfortunate phenomenon of goiters. In a certain type of salamander, this results in the retention of larval gills into adulthood. This salamander is somewhat famous and is commonly known as the axolotl. The waters of its native habitat in Central America are relatively lacking in iodine, and injecting an axolotl with small amounts of iodine will force a metamorphosis. This is not recommended, however, as the creature is perfectly happy being aquatic as an adult. Incidentally, this species has been popularized in part by extensive scientific studies. As it turns out, the axolotl is one of the salamander species with quite robust regenerative powers. There are other guild salamanders to be found in other parts of the world. In North America, one may find species from the genus Necturus living in various streams, ponds, and similar environments. These salamanders are commonly called mud puppies, as well as a few similarly whimsical names. Unlike the axolotl, the mud puppy is unaffected by iodine. Even an injection of thyroid hormone won't really do much to it except probably annoy it. 
These salamanders lack functional receptors for the hormone that would normally initiate metamorphosis. As any endocrinologist can tell you, a hormone without a receptor is about as useful as a message without an address to travel to. Another species of salamander with an exclusively aquatic lifestyle is a most unusual amphibian commonly known as the Ulm. It is found in cave systems in the Dinarides, a mountain range in southern Europe. This creature has a slender, almost serpentine body, with very much reduced legs. Each front limb has only three toes, and each back limb has only two. While there is a pigmented subspecies, most populations of the Ulm are distinctly lacking in pigmentation. This gives them a ghastly white appearance, with the feathery gills contrasting almost luridly in deep red hues. The eyes are atrophied, as they are of little use in the perpetual darkness of the cave systems the Ulm inhabits. This is also the reason for their lack of pigmentation. After all, both pigments and eyes cost a certain amount of nutrients and energy to grow and maintain. It is very common for cave-dwelling species of all sorts to lack these features whenever they are unnecessary. While the Ulm is able to go for some length of time without food, it is nonetheless a carnivore and an effective predator. It is quite capable of swimming in a rather eel-like fashion, and it has acute senses of smell, taste, and hearing. In addition, its skin possesses specialized electrical receptors, allowing it to sense the telltale muscle twitches of potential prey nearby. A sharp contrast to the Ulm would be a salamander commonly known as the Hellbender. Other names include the Mud Devil, the Water Dog, and the rather unflattering Snot Otter. One might guess that this particular salamander has a somewhat nasty temperament. Actually, although it is as carnivorous as any other of its ilk, it isn't especially aggressive. It certainly can bite when sufficiently provoked, but most of its reputation appears to be connected to its size and somewhat unusual appearance. The Hellbender is the largest variety of salamander found in North America, growing to over a foot in length. Larval forms are difficult to distinguish from mud puppies, but the adults lose their gills in the course of development. Despite this, the creature is very much an aquatic animal, living more or less exclusively in fast-flowing streams. In contrast to the Ulm, this creature doesn't swim so much as clamber about the riverbed in search of suitable meals. The rather impressive size of this amphibian poses something of a problem, so far as respiration is concerned. Unless there are structural adjustments, Gas exchange becomes increasingly difficult as body size increases. The Hellbender has a rather unique structural adjustment in the form of ample folds of skin down the sides of its body. The skin of these folds is richly supplied with capillaries, serving quite well in gas exchange. The habitat is also a vital part of the Hellbender's respiration, as rapidly flowing rivers and streams tend to have relatively high concentrations of dissolved oxygen. The Hellbender has another rather interesting quirk. Though its eyes are relatively small and poorly developed, it has photoreceptive cells all over its body. While these cells cannot form images for proper sight, this salamander is remarkably aware of just how much light might be shining on any given body part at any given moment. This is useful as the creature often has the habit of hiding away beneath large stones. A hellbender will be perfectly aware whether its tail happens to be sticking out in the open, as skin on the tail can sense light. While the hellbender is essentially harmless, some of its relatives are surprisingly dangerous. One such species is the eastern newt, found in the forests of eastern North America. This species is quite common and is characterized by a rather unusual life cycle. The newt begins its life, as most salamanders do, as an egg that hatches into a gilled larval tadpole. This tadpole eventually metamorphoses into a juvenile form that leaves the water and wanders the surrounding forest. This particular stage of life is known as an eft, and in the case of the eastern newt, this eft is a vibrant red color. One might expect a red salamander to stand out rather sharply among the browns and greens of the typical forest understory, even in autumn leaf litter, such an eft might still be difficult to miss. This is of little concern to the creature, though. All stages of the eastern newt carry a formidable chemical defense, whether in the skin or in the gelatinous material surrounding the eggs. Pufferfish aficionados will be familiar with the substance known as tetrodotoxin. In fact, this poison is produced by a number of fish, amphibians, and mollusks. 
It is a variety of neurotoxin that causes temporary muscle paralysis. This wouldn't be too much of a problem, apart from the fact that humans require certain muscles to breathe. After receiving a lethal dose of tetrodotoxin, the unfortunate individual would experience a number of unpleasant effects, including the slow and steady paralysis of their muscles. Eventually, they would lose the ability to breathe and suffocate. Perhaps worst of all, a person is conscious and aware during this entire experience. Fortunately, tetrodotoxin isn't readily absorbed through the skin. Thus, a person could pick up a newt without any ill effects. However, if a person handling a newt has even a small cut on their hand, they may receive a lethal dose. Thus, I would recommend simply leaving newts alone. The poison can also pass through mucous membranes, so I should emphasize that one should never, under any circumstances, attempt to eat or even lick a newt. In all honesty, I'm not sure what sort of person would even want to do such a thing, but such actions would lead to a death horrible enough to be worth advising against in any case. To return to the Eastern Newt's life cycle. After the Eft has wandered the woods a while, it returns to the water and becomes an adult. It loses its vibrant red coloring and regains a brown speckled aesthetic, not unlike that of the larva. It does not regain the external gills, however. Despite this, the adult newts are quite happily aquatic. They live in the water, they feed in the water, and they make more little newts together in the water. The courtship process is rather interesting in its way. The male eastern newt can be distinguished from the female by the presence of a large fin about its tail. This fin extends both above and below the tail and continues a little ways up the amphibian's back. The courtship dance involves undulating this fin in a fairly ardent display. Should the female be sufficiently impressed, the eventual result is a cluster of eggs covered in a gelatinous substance laced with the deadly tetrodotoxin. While this chemical defense is impressive enough by itself, I should perhaps mention a variety of newt found in the Iberian Peninsula. This newt, the Iberian ribbed newt, carries a row of raised tubercles down either side of its back. When provoked, the creature exudes a suitably toxic brew from glands in its skin as it pushes the points of its ribs out through these tubercles. Thus, in effect, the newt sprouts a series of poisoned needles down its sides. After the ribs are withdrawn, the newt's regenerative capabilities easily manage the necessary repairs. The defenses found in salamanders can be quite surprising at times, but their offensive weaponry can be rather impressive as well. One group in particular, commonly known as the lungless salamanders, has a number of species possessing tongues that any frog or chameleon might be proud of. The tongues can be extended with surprising rapidity to capture prey, and in more extreme cases they can extend outward to about three quarters of the length of the salamander's body. Incidentally, the term lungless is not a misnomer for these salamanders. Though there may be vestigial lungs at certain points in development, the members of this particular group lack lungs as adults and carry out respiration entirely through their skin. Perhaps it is not surprising that many of these salamanders are relatively slender, as a narrow body tends to facilitate efficient gas exchange. This lack of lungs doesn't seem to impair the athleticism of these creatures, as several species are accomplished climbers. The genus Anides, in particular, contains a few species of arboreal salamanders that ascend to seek prey in the treetops by night, and return to the ground each day to hide away in the leaf litter. We have considered only a handful of salamander species, as an exhaustive study would require hours, if not days. Limited though the sample may be, it should be sufficient to demonstrate at least a few points. These creatures display surprising variety, and often defy the expectations one might have for a group of small, cold-blooded things with soft, permeable skin and clawless toes. They are also not without their dangers, and are probably best left to go about their lives in at least relative peace. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.